Time to begin our services this morning. We're certainly glad to see everyone out fellowshipping together. I have a lot of announcements to make. Please bear with me. Concerning those who are sick, Ruth Lemon is doing better with her trembling. Uh, thank you for your continued prayers for her. Helen West McIntyre can both use our prayers this time. Uh, please remember Oakley in your prayers. Rhonda's brother-in-law is recovering from open heart surgery. He's still dealing with Parkinson's. Um, also, please remember Danny Carpenter in your prayers for his recovery. Bill Spears is uh, having some trouble with his feet swelling. Y'all were quite well the other day and is having some pain. He's able to be out today and we're glad to see him. Uh, Danny Freeman needs prayers for health concerns. Lonnie Kupner has not been feeling well. He had a CT scan last week. He has not got the results from that yet. Uh, also, please pray for Carl Cooper. He has a, a spine bleed and may need surgery. Uh, this is a friend of Ann and Elvis's. I have a note here, it says, please pray for Robert O'Dell. He has cirrhosis of the liver, stage four to five kidney disease, pancreatitis, swelling in his legs, fluid in his eye, and lesions in his esophagus. <coughs> He's having a really tough time right now. Um, have a note, it says, uh, thanks for the birthday cards. J.R. Flynn, is there uh, any others that are sick that I've overlooked or? Okay. Steve's mother is a gentleman that comes to church with Look at her health on Saturday for heart cancer. She's got walking in her heart. She's got a tiny brain and she has a child black or a cross in the head. All right. Um, Morning after um, morning service, we're having a potluck downstairs. Everybody, please plan to stay for that. Um, and on November the 27th, the traveling youth group will be at Barlow Vincent Church of Christ at 5. Uh, they will have a food fellowship after the song service. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? <coughs> <laughs> if anyone's interested, you see what. Okay. Um, yep, one more thing. If, uh, if you're interested in going to CYC, um, please see Mike, and uh, he'll give you information on that. And uh, we'll go from there. Anything else? There's, there's calendars in the back if anybody wants them. All right, Mike's going to be leading our singing this morning. Everybody join in. Page 25. <laughs> Notice we have some visitors here today. If uh, anyone needs a communion cup for here, then just don't put it on that table back there. <clears throat> Page 25. <clears throat> Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go Anywhere he leads me in this world below Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid Anywhere Yeah. 
good to see this fine number out this this, uh, this morning. And um, may once again be the first day of the week, have an opportunity to surround this table, partake of these emeralds, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He established this memorial feast on the night he was betrayed and used the unleavened bread to represent his body and the fruit of the vine to represent his blood that was shed for the sins of mankind. There's uh, several passages of scripture in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 25, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and Hebrews chapters 4 and 9, where we can see that uh, it's revealed for us that God came up with the plan of salvation before the foundation of the world. Before he even made the world, before he created us in his image, in his omniscience, he knew that man was going to sin, that man was going to need redemption. And he came up with this plan of salvation that involved the sacrifice of his only begotten son. And John 3.16 says that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'd like to read for you from Romans chapter 8 starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that we, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We come together every first day of the week to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And this helps us to understand, one, just how much God loves us. And two, that as being born again, baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ, therefore there is now no condemnation. And that's why they call it the good news. So let's focus our mind on this, uh, this sacrifice that Jesus made, uh, surrendering his own body and blood to pay the sin debt for all of mankind. Let's give thanks as we partake of the bread. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day, for this opportunity to come together and to worship you, Father to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us now as we partake of this bread that represents his body that hung on that cross between heaven and earth. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we ask these things. Amen. Let's continue our thanks. Father, we thank you for this memorial feast that your son established on our behalf. Father, to help us keep forever fresh in our minds the sacrifice that he made. Um, exactly how much love that you have for us and he had for us to go through the excruciating ordeal that he suffered on that day on Calvary. We ask, Father, that you bless us one and all as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Let us do so in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that concludes this portion of the worship service. As a matter of convenience, there's a basket on the table in the back as you leave the uh, auditorium. Uh, for your free will offering. If you haven't done so and would like to, you can do that on the way out.
Uh, page number two. Page two, uh, sing verses one through three. <clears throat> A wonderful Savior is Jesus the Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He guides my soul in the path of right, where rivers of pleasure I see. He
this morning. If I were to ask you to think for a moment about every religious belief that you had ever heard in your life, maybe you want to write them down, I don't know, but think about every religious belief and, and write those doctrines or beliefs down as you think about them. And, and they go through your mind, something like, well, maybe once saved, always saved would be one or all you have to do is say this prayer and then you will be saved you should worship on Saturday because that's the Sabbath you should worship Allah because Allah is God and you could go on and I imagine on and on and list these different doctrines or religious beliefs. And, and although you see new churches seemingly pop up all the time, most of the doctrines that you see are rehashed at this point in time or just a, 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 a tree off of something else, if you will, a little bit different than the one that they might have come from. But if I will tell you a lie, that would be what? A lie. Now, if you knew I was lying, you could say, I, I think he's lying. I think he's not telling me the truth. And you might even try to look that up somewhere and say, well, you know, he said this this morning. I'm not so sure that's the truth. And, and, and so I need to think about that for a little bit. Some people might say that. Some people might get off their, their, their phone or their iPad or their computer and say, well, I'm going to Google what Elvis said today and see how, how that comes out on the Internet. And I've had people do that. And that's okay. You want to Google, you can Google. But when... I need to find out the absolute truth. There's only one place that I can go. Now, you've probably bought a used car before. Most of us in here have bought used cars. And you have to know this, that when you walk on the lot, they're waiting for you. They've sat there for hours waiting. For, I sold used cars, so I know this for a fact. They've sat there for hours, sometimes days, waiting, and, and they see you pull up, and they're very excited. Ooh. Here they come. I'm going to sell them that one. And you look at it, and you want, it looks nice, because they've, take, they've taken some time, and they've, they've cleaned it up, and they've, they've polished it, and shined it, and, and they might have even cleaned the motor, steam cleaned the motor on it. 
and they present it to you and, and, and you take it for that little five mile test drive and you come back and, and, and you say, well, that just looks nice. <laughs> and you park it in victory, what we call victory row. The reason it's that name, because if when you come back from a test drive, if the sales, the sales says, if this is the car, you park it right there. That's victory row. Victory for them, not necessarily you, but anyway. And, and they walk you to the office, did you go, you open that door? Let's come on in, let's, let's fill out some paperwork. And they set you down, they take all your information, and, and, and they go back, and, and, and you for financing, they do the credit check and all that, and sooner or later they find, you find yourself in the finance manager's office and, and, and signing the paperwork, and you're out the door, and you have the keys, and now it's yours. Now here's my question. At any time, did they tell you a lie? I, when I sold cars, I'm not told this story before, but um, I didn't do it for long because I had issues with it because it was very unethical. And I tried to get a new car dealer across the street, and I almost did, but because uh, I thought that would be more ethical because at least you weren't selling them junk. And we were selling them junk at 29% interest. And, and what would happen is there would be a car, and the car wouldn't start. And there's a reason that, that the, the salesman goes up, well, I'm going to, for a test drive, I'm going to bring the car up here for you. Because they want to go, and they start, and they get it running, and everything like that, and they bring it over. Well, I went to get a, a car for a customer that means nothing. So I run in and talk to the manager. I said, the car won't start. How am I going to sell a car that won't start? They said, well, get the jumper, jump the rock. We'll, we'll get them over here looking at this. The under, you know, whatever, the stereos, and, and you get out there and get it done. Me and the other guy got out there and get it done, and we bring it right up. Well, during the test drive, they turned it off. <laughs> well, the battery obviously didn't charge long enough. It didn't start. The manager comes out. He's a shyster, shyster guy type thing. Pulls the headlights out. So, oh, look, the headlights were on. That's why it didn't start. Here you go. You know, we'll jump it real quick. Oh, there you go. You buy it, and it does that again. We'll throw in a new battery. We sold the car, by the way. But have you ever been lied at? Probably. Then I have been. If you bought a house, you probably got two stories. One story uh, when you bought the house. Another story after. You know, there, there, there's. Places in life that people lie about us. And, and I think there's more lies told religiously. Now, now, sometimes people don't aim to lie. They really don't. They, they might not know the truth themselves. I have a lot of friend and, and friends in the denominational world, and, and, and they just don't know the truth because they bought into a lie. Remember when they used to say the world was flat? A lot of people believe that because they bought into that until they found out it wasn't flat, it was round. Some people might still believe it's flat. I don't know. But when we look at biblical doctrine or testing of the biblical doctrine, what we have to understand a few things. And studying 1 John, that we notice that the prophets were important leaders and teachers for the church in the New Testament period. Ephesians 4 11 says, And he gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So this is talking about the, the New Testament church, and, and there'll be a couple passages that shows us that God gave them these things in these positions to help advance them in the cause of the church. And so you have to look at, in the New Testament, or in, in this time period, a prophet, or a teacher, or a preacher, or, or a shepherd, who's preaching the truth of God and someone who is not preaching the truth of God. And, and, and so John here, in this particular time period, the biggest issue and the biggest problem is they would, did not say that Jesus came in the flesh. Now we will talk about the confession in just a moment, but the confession is what? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, they didn't believe, many, I should say, didn't believe that he came to the earth in the flesh. We'll visit that for just a second. And because of that, he probably couldn't have died on the cross 
been raised, and, and, and so we kind of throw everything out of the window, so to speak. If we don't believe that Jesus came to this earth, and we would know the story of born of a virgin, born in a manger, they believe no, none of that's true. He didn't come in the flesh. We're going to look at three things this morning quickly with you. First, we have to, the Bible would say, test the spirits. Now, when we see this verse, beloved, so, so John is gathering the, the church around and saying, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, do not believe, and my, my dad used to tell me this, do not believe everything you hear. You ever heard that before? Now, my uncle would say, never pick up any wooden nickels. I never really understood that because I never saw a wooden nickel, so I was like, oh, wooden, no. But my dad would say, don't believe everything you hear. And sometimes don't believe everything you read unless it's from the right source. He says, don't believe every spirit, small s there, notice that. I'm not talking about the spirit of God there. But test the spirit, small s, to see whether they're from God or not. In other words, in our language, test the doctrine, test the belief to see if it's from God. For many, notice the word many, false prophets or false teachers have gone out into the world. Now in 2 John, the author would add the word deceivers. Now that gets a little more specific because a deceiver is someone who purposely tries to give you false information or deceive you. And, and, and 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of the Christ in the flesh. So we see the initial problem there in 2 John, those who do not confess the, the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Someone who is an antichrist, we've defined this before, someone who is against Christ. The worldview would tell you, well, there's going to be one antichrist, and they're going to come in this particular time in history, and this, and, 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 and John says, no, listen, there's a whole bucket full of antichrist, and that's anybody who doesn't believe, who is against, or doesn't believe in the doctrine of Christ Jesus. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teachings has both the Father and the Son. So we see in the third letter, third John, circumstances have begun to change and the apostle commended Christians who search out the false prophets. So by the time we get to third John, the, the church is saying, oh, I've identified these people as false prophets, and we're getting them out of the way. So between 1st, 2nd John, and 3rd John, we have the warnings, 1st and 2nd, to, to look, hey, you better find these false prophets, you better identify these people that are spreading false doctrine and false teaching, and 3rd and John, we see, now, now you've begun to get them out of the way, out of the process, and that's important because we, we need to do that. 3 John chapter 1, verse 5, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. 3 John chapter 1, verse 8, Therefore we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So, distinguishing between true false prophets, if you will, and false ones had been an old Sustained problem with God's people. Moses had warned Israel that among the inhabitants of Canaan would be those who practice witchcraft and divination. So Moses sent the people down and said, listen, you know, we're going to be going into Canaan, but in the land there, there are those who practice witchcraft. Stay away from them. Those are, there's those who practice sorcery. Stay away from them. There'll be all these people that practice all these things. Stay away from them. And it's interesting because if, if we had to wear signs or shirts that would say false prophet, that'd be easy to find. 
wouldn't they? If I had a shirt on this morning and said, prophet, or someone else would say, false prophet, that'd be easy to tell the difference, or teacher, or false teacher, or something like that, if there'd be some identifying marks, but they're not. And so what false teachers, and the false teachers that are going to get us are probably not that much different than us. And they, they might hang a, a carrot there for a little bit. I think of the divisions within the Church of Christ itself. The biggest division in the church is over personal taste. Instrumental music. You like music with your worship? You like just a cappella singing? That has caused more division in the church than any other. Now, there's been a whole lot of other divisions in the church. In the 50s, we started with divisions over eating in the building, over giving to orphans' homes and, and organized contributions and things like that, and other different doctrines. 1857 was the day that in, in Kentucky someone brought up a little instrument that looked like a piano and said, I'm going to play along with the, with the singing. And by the 19, 1900s, they had split off into two other sections, two other, church, two other religions, if you will. And, and so there's, you know, so how do you say, well, I like it this way, you like it that way. Where do we need to come? We need to come to the Word of God. And, and, and it can't be a lazy Susan type of thing. It has to be when I study and apply the Word of God to my life and to my religion. Now, you say, well, you know, God loves everybody. And he's going to like us whether we worship in here or worship there or worship somewhere else in a different way. We're all, after all, it's all one God and we're praising the same God and it doesn't really matter. I take you to Leviticus chapter 10. <laughs> You know, when your dad's a big shot, the kids kind of think they got a little bit of leeway, don't they? Moses is the leader of the nation. He's God's mouthpiece, God's prophet. And his brother is Aaron. Now, Aaron is just not a priest. He's the high priest, which was only one high priest in the whole nation. He deals directly with God. So you think if anybody gave him a little slack, wouldn't it be Aaron? Aaron has some boys. You know how boys are. You know, they get carried away sometimes. They decide to have some worship in Leviticus chapter 10. Now God identified the way he wanted to be worshipped. And the Bible says they offered strange or one version I believe is the NIV and I love the way the NIV does it unauthorized fire to God in other words they put something in worship God didn't want to worship it's one God listen it's one God so we're all coming together we're all worshiping God it doesn't really matter it seemed to didn't it because God killed him Right there and then dead. Next. You, you see, when we have to take the word of God and, and, and read it and try to understand it and, and use it to test the spirits, if you will. Mark chapter 13, verse 6. Jesus says, many will come in my name saying, I am he. And it would lead many astray. Acts chapter 8, and that verse 9 through 10. But there was a man named Simon. Now Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city. He's a magician. He, he amazed people in Samaria. He, he would say, uh, 
that he himself was somebody great. I'm somebody great. I'm, I'm a great mag magician, mag magician. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying this man has, watch this, the power of God, and they called him great. He might have been a good magician, but he didn't have the power of God. He wasn't in that godly category, if you will. So John urged his readers to test the spirits. In this case, spirit stood for the inward man, the heart of those who had a message they claimed to be from God. Jesus would say this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16, Beware of the false prophets. I, I can hear Jesus saying, this is a sermon on the mount, Beware of the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they're, they're, not, they're going to be hard to identify. They're going to be disguised, if you will. But inwardly, they are ravishing wolves. You may recognize them by their fruits. The grape gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Finally, 2 Peter 2 and verse 1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be many false teachers among you who will secretly bring destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. Well, secondly, not only are we to test the spirits, but we're to Know the Spirit of God. You will know the Spirit of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In this particular time, this is the major problem, the dividing point. Uh, so we're, I, need, I need you to understand this picture here. We're not dealing with People outside the church, if you will. You know the world needs Christ, it needs God. They're outside and they're in different religions. Some of them, some of them in no religion at all. Some of them may be atheists. We're talking about in the four walls of the church. I have to understand, when we look at some of the, the books in the Bible, they're not written to the world per se. They're written to the church. And this is one of them. You say, well, how can there be things in the church that grow out? It's, it's in just about every book in the New Testament. You see, in Acts chapter 20, it's, Paul had been preaching for the church of Ephesus for three years, and he brings the elders together and says, listen, upon my departure, same language that Jesus used, savage wolves will come in. In other words, Jesus, I've been here to, to hold everything in, but the second I leave, Jesus is saying, or excuse me, Paul is saying, there's going to be certain problems here. So John is saying the same thing. Inside the church. Now, you can say, so I don't want you to take this verse somewhere where it doesn't need to go. Because you can take it to someone who doesn't know anything, you know, about God and say, well, do you believe in Christ? Uh, yeah. Well, then I guess you're, so it says there, it says you're, you're, you're from God. This is in the church. Now, you take the church, maybe it's a church of, you know, pick a number, 500 people, and you go around and you survey them, and you find out the true question, do you believe that Jesus came in the flesh? Yes or no? No. Okay, here. Do you believe, next person, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Yes, okay, here. Now, you survey the people, and you break the people apart. Okay, these are from God, these are not. And that's what John is saying here. Understand, in the church, you'll know the Spirit of God. That everyone that confesses. So you say, okay, they've all confessed here that Jesus came in the flesh. These are from God. Now the verb know, beniski, could be a present imperative, know this, or a present indicative, you may know this. So John offered his readers instruction on the way they were to distinguish true prophets from false prophets, once by saying this, by this you know the Spirit of God. So the question John's readers posted was, how do we distinguish between true prophets and false prophets? 
Now, when we get to today's age, we have to go a little bit deeper, don't we? Because that was the one particular problem in that particular church. And if you look through, you know, the Bible, you can look at the church of Corinth. Okay, let's make a list of problems that the church of Corinth had. That list would be pretty long. They had some issues that were the church at Rome. Did they have issues? Yes, they had issues. They let's make a list. So each church seemed to have problems. They seemed to have different problems that, that the author, Paul or Peter, whoever, would tell them we have to work through, or John would tell, we have to work through these things. And and so the the, the Christian message can be compromised in, in many ways. But the appearance of the Lord in the flesh was the immediate concern for that church that John was addressing. And the immediate task for his readers was to apply was the willingness to confess Jesus as the one that came in the flesh. Jesus is from God. Revelation, now in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, we notice that you, it says, yet you have this, you hate the works of the Nicolonians, which you also, and the Nicolonians were a Baal type of a god, and, and the problem here is they would offer their meat to idols and then bring it into the church. You know, it's like getting, you know, I'm going to get a, a half a cow from, from Mark tomorrow, and, 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 and then I find out that he offered that half a cow to an idol before it got here. Well, I probably shouldn't eat that meat because it's been offered to a god, to a false god, you see. And so that was in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6. That was one of their issues that they had. But we come back to John, first, John 1 and verse 14, and we know that section of the Bible, don't we? John says this, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We're talking about Christ. First, we establish Him in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Before that time, we establish Christ in the beginning with God. When we get down to verse 14, we see, and the Word, who was that? Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. If I believe anything, I need to believe this. Because really, it's the key to our salvation, isn't it? That Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus had no human body before he came. But he had a body just like you and I, when he came to this earth. Born as a little baby, if you dropped the baby, he would get, you know, get injured. If, if Jesus put his hand on the stove, guess what? It would hurt. If he hit his hand, he was a carpenter, son, so if he tried some carpentry and he hit his hand with the hammer, guess what? That would hurt. If they put him on a cross and crucified him, that would hurt. He would bleed, he would die. He had a human form just like you and I. Well, finally this morning, we come to the point where it really attaches all of us together, whatever generation that we're in, the confession of Christ Jesus. The confession of Christ Jesus. Notice the words in verse 3. Every spirit. Now this word spirit is small s. It does not mean the spirit of God. It means the spirit within us. We could substitute that for every person, if you will, every person or individual that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Confession and belief are really starting points, aren't they? That's where we, you know, we get ready to run the race and we start at the little line there and the person shoots the gun off and we start. Belief and confession are really starting points. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. In other words, you heard the false teachers were coming. They came. They've been here. They've been here for a long time. They existed then. They exist now. They're everywhere. Don't be surprised if someone tries to give you some false doctrine about the Bible, because they probably will. But I want to spend the rest of our time this morning on this confession. 
See, false prophets were identified by their deeds, but believers were also recognized them as false by what they taught and what they confessed. Every spirit refers to teachers who are inspired or who claims inspiration. Now, there's a difference there. In this case, the false teachers are referred to, and John flatly admits that they are not God's mouthpiece. Confess Jesus was to declare that he had been present on earth in the flesh. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, children, it is the last hour, John would say. And you have heard that Antichrist is coming, and now many Antichrists, many Antichrists, many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. Anyone in the church from any time or place who encompasses a basic tenet of the apostles' teaching about the work or teaching of Jesus of Nazareth is an antichrist. In other words, if you, if you go to other teaching than the apostles' teaching, you're against the teaching of Christ. And John urges readers to measure those who claim to be prophets by the teaching they had heard from the apostles. First John chapter 2 and verse 22, whoever is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. When we talk to people about becoming a Christian, that's the first thing we ask, isn't it? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes or no question, really, isn't it? I would assume if you're here this morning, you probably would say yes to that question. You would say, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because the people who aren't here, or maybe there's someone else, I don't know, but, but they may say, well, no, I, I don't believe that. And so, once again, if we have to divide people up, people say, some people say, I believe it, some people say, I don't. Whoever... 1 John 2, verse 22, whoever is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, and this is the Antichrist, or he who denies the Father and the Son. 2 Thessalonians 2, and verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way. Here's good advice. Apostle Paul. Paul, do you have any, I, I, I'm going to be a Christian. I really want to be a Christian. Do you have any advice for me? Yeah, I, I do. Probably has a lot of advice for you, don't you think? Here's one. Let no one deceive you. Wow. How do I know that someone's deceiving me? Only one way. I take this book that I have, I open it, and I read. Oh. Turn the page somewhere else, and I read. Oh. Oh, I just happened to open to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus' sermon. That's a good place to start, isn't it? See the crowd? He went up on the mountain. And, and I read what Jesus said. And how does Jesus feel about anger? Well, it's right here. How does Jesus feel about our position in life? You're salt and you're the light of hope. That's, that seems to be what Jesus says. And so, you know, he says in 2 Thessalonians 2 3, don't, don't let anybody deceive you, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction Romans 10 and verse 9 through 10 because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confession is made to salvation we need to believe that Jesus is the Christ don't we? that's our first step When you sit down and study with somebody, the first thing you do is establish biblical authority. It doesn't matter if I tell you about Jesus until I establish biblical authority. That the Bible is the inspired word of God. And once we establish biblical authority, the next thing we really do is work on belief in Jesus Christ. So once I believe in the Bible, this is where I need to go, belief in Jesus Christ. 
Matthew 10, verse 32, verse 33. So everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus says, before men, him will I acknowledge before my Father in heaven. I picture this. Do you picture this? Have you ever had in your mind the scene of Judgment Day? I hope you've thought a couple of minutes and had Judgment Day in your mind. And Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 18 is, is a good place to go to kind of look at, at some of that. And if you're not right with God, that's a perfect passage for those who are not right with God. Revelation 20, and verse 11 through 18. But for those who are right with God, what we picture a little bit different story. We're, we picture John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, and, 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 and Revelation 21, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8, and, and those types of things. So we, we picture God looking at us, and Christ standing there kind of as our uh, defense attorney, if you will. And the charges are sin. It's a simple charge, isn't it? Are you guilty of sin or not guilty of sin? Guilty, Your Honor. Have you confessed Jesus as the Christ? Jesus is standing right there. That person, no. That person, yes. Oh, yes? Okay. Like this way. Uh, or something to that confession. But then he says in verse 33, but whoever denies me, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's kind of an easy scene, isn't it? You know, it, it's we, we picture sometimes a, a list of every sin that we ever committed and, and going through those sins and, and say, well, this is a borderline sin, you know, God would say, that's a border. I don't think God would ever use those words, but borderline said, man, well, I guess he got tricked there. No, no, sin is sin is sin with God. And we're either on the right side of God with Jesus Christ and believing that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and living our life in that direction, being baptized, having our sins washed away, or, or we don't. God is a righteous judge. This morning, if you've not yet been baptized in Christ, we encourage you to do that. Maybe it's time that, that you became a Christian and walked with God. I, I know on Judgment Day, you would say, yes, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I spent the rest of my life walking with God. Or, or perhaps you maybe you've done that and, and you wandered and, and, and you want to be right with God. You want to be encouraged. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you. Won't you come as we stand? And as we stand. Just as I am.
services. Is uh, there anything needs announced? If not, we'll have a prayer and uh, be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we once again come to you thanking you, Father, for uh, this day you've given us and uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, you uh, for bringing us uh, visitors today through your providence, Father, that they are here. Uh, we thank you for that. We uh, uh, Acknowledge, Father, at this time, Father, that we, we know that you are the creator of all things. And uh, uh, we just uh, hope, Father, and pray, Father, that uh, you were pleased with our worship today, Father. And, uh, we pray, Father, all these things through your son Jesus' holy name. Amen.